So I want you to start out with just picturing the time that Jesus was in 2,000 years ago. And that would have been really hard 50 years ago, but now with movies, if you've seen The Passion of the Christ or you've seen uh, The Chosen or any of those movies, we can kind of picture what was going on back then. So I want you to picture this guy. And he's got a hammer and he's got a chisel. And he's got a piece of stone in front of him. And on that stone, he's chiseling something word by word, and it's called the gospel. That's literally what it's called is the gospel. The gospel was to announce a savior. And he was chiseling on this stone to announce that the savior has come and that the savior, his name is the Prince of Peace. And that this savior is not just the savior of one country, but this is the savior of all mankind. And that this savior was literally going to end all wars. Every single war was going to be ended and peace was going to be brought into the land. His birth was announced on this stone, this gospel, that it was literally going to change time. That when this man was born, all of time was going to be recreated. And it's, it's true, it did happen. Time was recreated when this man was born. The seasons, the months, uh, the harvest times or, or uh, different events throughout the community were changed because of this man's birth. And when people saw this gospel put up, that they would, they would put these stone tablets in front of the cities so when people walked into the city, they could read the gospel. They could read the rules. And when you entered that city, you were saying, I am submitting to this gospel, that this is the law of the land. This is the rules. Before they had the st it all chiseled out on stones, they would first send out delegates on scrolls. And the delegate would go into the town and he would unroll the scroll and he would announce the gospel. And what he was really doing is he was announcing, this is a military word actually, he was announcing the, the, the terms of the agreement. And he was proclaiming that a new governor, a new emperor, a new king was in charge. And this is what he accomplished in military battle. The word gospel in Greek means evangelion. It's where we get our word evangelize. And so they would go into these towns and they would read this scroll and say that this emperor, this governor, this figure is the true king and you have to obey these rules. They also called it the good news or evangelia. To this, when they would read this to the town, to some, it was good news. To others, not so much. Because it wasn't really just an announcement, it was a warning. It was a warning that that king had conquered everyone, and if you didn't follow up with those rules, then you were actually going against this new emperor or this king. The one thing they also announced when they brought in the gospel, when they brought in the good news, was that this king was God. He was one with God. He was a deity, and he demanded worship. And so they would set these certain times of the week where they would actually worship this God. And when they worshiped this God, what it was really announcing is that they were one with him, that they were unified. And so this good news, this gospel, when it was proclaimed in every Roman town, it was not just a warning, but it was meant to unify the community as one. Now, most of you in this room, because you're sitting in a church, you think I'm talking about Jesus Christ. But long before Jesus, in 9 BC, Emperor Augustus was born. And what we now know as Turkey was the beginning of the Roman Empire, and they would chisel and put these, these tablets along the way so people knew that the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Prince of Peace, Augustus, was over that town and over that nation. The good news was something everyone knew about long before Jesus Christ. They used those exact terms, evangelia and evangelion, the good news, the gospel. So I say this for two reasons. First, now you know why the Christians were persecuted. Now you know why the early church was hated. And I'm going to get into this more, but I, I, I can't stress this enough. 
The message of Jesus Christ was highly political, highly political, because he was announcing a gospel, and his followers were announcing some good news. And that was good news to some, but not to others. But this was a direct counter against Rome, that when they would come in and proclaim this, they were proclaiming there was a new king, a new Caesar, a new kingdom that was here. This is why now you will never read Mark 1 the same way. Sometimes we read the scriptures and we miss the intensity of it. Mark 1 starts his gospel out with this. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So you got the Roman Empire who has the gospel of Augustus, the gospel of the emperor who claimed to be the son of God. And then these guys walk in and gals, St. Junia and them, would walk in and say, we are here to announce the real gospel. As they're walking through a stone tablet that proclaims the king, they're proclaiming another kingdom. Hence why they were persecuted so much. Not only that, listen to how Jesus starts his evangelia in Mark 1. Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. Not God's. God. This is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus announced the true gospel. He was the king, not one of many kings. He is, his is the real kingdom, and he was one with God. And what he's really saying when he says repent, so repent means to change your mind. That's the literal word, metanoia, to change the way you think and act. But it also means to turn around. So this is so serious because what Jesus was saying is, you're focused on the Roman kingdom. You're focused on the Jewish kingdom. You need to turn your attention away from this false kingdom and focus on me and join my cause. And 2,000 years later, we're still focusing on the American kingdom, the Jewish kingdom, the political establishment, when Christ says we are to turn and give all our allegiance to the real king. The real gospel. That must have been kind of sketch for the apostles walking into Roman towns proclaiming the good news and the gospel. Here's my point with this sermon today. What is the gospel? There are many gospels out there. There are many different views within Christianity what the gospel is. I do this trick, all, not a trick, I do this thing all the time when I'm with other pastors. I always ask them, you tell me what you think the gospel is. They never agree. Because they want to add this or they want to add that. And some denominations think you do this and some denominations think you do that. And so even within Christianity, what is the gospel, the king, the kingdom? What is the gospel you and I are called to proclaim? What's the real gospel? Again, this is so important. This is a teaching moment today. It's not a bunch of stories and all that. This is a teaching rather than preaching moment because I think we need to know what we are giving people. I think we need to know what Jesus commanded us to tell people. So I've said this before, I'm gonna say it again. One of the changes at Zootown Church and why, why I've leaned more towards Orthodox and Catholicism and, and really just the early church is because we've missed a lot of the context of this. And here's one of the problems, and I just say this, you've heard me say this before, if you're new with us, this kind of gives you my heart. One of the problems with us is we, and it's not our fault, we're just born in you know, America and you know, 2,000 years later, but we take our culture and we take it back to the gospel and we try to make the gospel say what our culture says instead of knowing what the culture was, what those words were, and bringing it 2,000 years later. This is one of the biggest problems with Western Christianity is we keep mingling these two. And so... We gotta understand the context. We have to understand the history. So I've said it before, I'll say it again. Jesus was talking to those people at that time. It had to make sense to them. He was speaking their language. He was speaking their culture. So even, you know, as I've talked about the afterlife and hell and all those different things, we take our view to that instead of their view to us. 
Even the word judgment. When we say the word judge, what do we think? The guy with the gavel and the wig on and whatever it is, right? And we think he's there to put on punishment. The real view of judgment in the scriptures was a judge would differentiate between a case. He was trying to say who was right and wrong so that way they could come together in restoration. So even our view of judgment is skewed by this. So it's so important to understand the culture. So that's why I explain this to you. And so let me just be clear. Some of these things I say, everyone thinks they're new. They're not new. They're old. (laughs) We've just lost a lot of it. And so we need to understand what the gospel is. It's incredibly important how we relay The gospel. So, in my study of the early church, here's what I have found. A major shift happened in theology when Rome got in bed with the church. Constantine, uh, Emperor Justinian, there there was this blending that happened within the church. And what happened then is you can see it, that as culture grew, it's almost like the king or the Caesar or emperor or whatever it is, even into the 1200s, the king became almost one with God, the sovereignty, the sovereign nation. And so they started using some of these terms to control people instead of free people. Even the King James Version, I know some of you love it. I love it for the poetry. The problem with the King James Version is really it was in many ways created so that his subjects would be you know, liable to the king. Why would you put your name on the Bible? So this caused a lot of distraction from the gospel. And what it did is it caused the gospel to be tainted. It caused it to be muddied. And it really what it did is it put barriers in between people and the gospel. Because you can control people that way. When you add steps, you can control people in a way. And it just got muddied. And so let me give you a recap real quick. My last sermon was called Last Days to a New Earth. This sermon's called New Earth. And what we're doing is we're looking at the 50 days or the few weeks after Jesus rose from the dead. And this is important because now he's translating to us what he really wants us to know, but through the lens of the cross and the resurrection. Before that, they didn't have that lens. So before he ascends to his father, he's telling us exactly what he wants us to do. It's wonderful. Don't we all just want to know what Jesus wants you to do? Well, he explained it to us, and what he's telling us is this is how the new creation is going to come into effect. Last week, we looked at how Jesus is risen from the dead, and Mary sees him. The women were the first one to witness Jesus, and they run, and they keep telling the other disciples who are hiding in a rich man's house, and they won't believe the women because a woman's testimony was invalid back then. So Mary just keeps trying to tell them, I've seen the risen Lord. Finally, Jesus knows that men are stupid, and so he shows up, and he walks into the house. He literally shows up in a house, and he says, shalom, shalom. That's a, he says, peace be with you. But in Aramaic, it was shalom. That means we are together. It means you have peace with God. It means a perfect possible union. There's no separation between us. So he walks in and says, shalom. We are unified. We are one. And then he says, look at my scars. And what he's saying is, for all eternity, I have these scars. What he was really saying is, it's finished and it's done. The cross is the finished work of Jesus Christ. There's nothing left to do. Christ has defeated death in Hades. He has defeated sin. And he says, believe the good news. So he's trying to show them it's accomplished. It's finished. And then he says, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. And in the Greek, that means an alignment. The Father sent Jesus. Now Jesus is sending us. But we're in a line with him. So we are giving the same message that the Father gave Jesus and Jesus is to give us. But what is that message? John 20. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you, shalom. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now listen to this. He's saying, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this is what I want you to do. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Is he serious? That's a lot of pressure. I mean, do you you feel comfortable with that kind of authority? 
I forgive you, I forgive you, not so much you. You're forgiven, you're forgiven. Oh, I don't know about you, I saw your Instagram. Is that the kind of authority we want? Well, that's the authority Christ has given us. He meant what he said. So in a few weeks, we're gonna look at why he breathed on them. I'm gonna break next week and do a, a sermon on Mary, Mother Mary, and kind of bring together why she was favored among women. But he breathed on them to restore Eden. I keep telling you guys that. Jesus came and flipped everything. He's here to restore things. He's not a destroyer, he's a restorer. And in Garden of Eden, what did he do? He made us dirt. Sometimes I feel like dirt, don't you? And then he breathed on them. The word actually means to inflate. He's doing pretty good. <laughs> it means to inflate us. To action. So then, sin, fall, all that, boom, goes down, humanity's a wreck. Whew, he breathes on us and inflates us once again. But he's doing it for a purpose, because we have a mission to share the good news. So when he says, take, receive the Holy Spirit in Greek, that means take the Holy Spirit as your companion, as your companion. So before he sends them out, he says, I'm giving you a companion the Holy Spirit. What he's doing there again is he's unifying us with God, with the Holy Spirit. He is the seal over us. Now let me show you something cool. The Roman coins had a picture of Caesar. The image, the seal of Caesar was on Roman coins and it said, Caesar, son of God. And when he breathed on us and he said, take the Holy Spirit as your companion, he's saying, you have the seal of God over you. But the Holy Spirit was also given to us for our regeneration. We're going down, we're going down. He gives us the Holy Spirit. Boom, we're being reborn. We're being reborn. And it's regenerating us. And so the Holy Spirit's given to us to know we are sealed. We are joint heirs of the resurrection. But it's also given to us for power. The evangelia that we are presented is done through the power of the Holy Spirit, the boldness of God. So here's the meat, okay? This is a scary authority. If you forgive somebody, they're forgiven. If you don't, they're not. That scares me. So I looked all week. I tried to make this passage not mean what it means. You know what it means? If you forgive somebody, they're forgiven. If you don't, they're not. Now let me break this down. This is what I mean by what gospel are we called to preach? What gospel does Christ, what is the good news? How we have heard it, how I have preached it in the past, is you are not forgiven until you ask. You are under God's judgment. You are in sin until you ask. Is that what Jesus says the gospel is right here? Let me ask you, does Jesus' scars fade away when someone doesn't believe? When someone believes, does he go back up on the cross to forgive them? Or does his scars scream the finished work of God? I've seen this the opposite way. If we don't know what the gospel is, sometimes we can miss how we're even extending the gospel. I mean, I've heard people do this where it's like, yeah, I shared the gospel with them and they didn't receive it. I guess they're just going to hell. And I'm like, how did you share it? See how this is scary sometimes because we can say, well, see, we shared it the best we could. I'm like, did you? How do we share it? He's telling us right here. It is incredibly important how you share the good news. It's incredibly important. So let me break this down. That word forgive in this passage that he uses, it's actually a different word that he uses in other places. It's a fiamai. So when he says, if you forgive those, a fiamai, that word means to let go or to divorce or to leave it in the past. So what he's saying is, you proclaim forgiveness over people. Not you're not forgiven, not you have to say the sinner's prayer, not you have to get baptized because it's the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. You are to proclaim you are forgiven. That's the good news. You are forgiven. Jesus ain't going back up on the cross when you say the prayer. You are 
Forgiven, the finished work of Jesus. That word forgive is in the perfect tense. That's a, that in the Greek, that means it's done, it's over. It's not in the future, it's a finished work. And we are to proclaim the finished work of God over people. Here's the interesting thing. When he goes on to not forgive, it's kriteo, which means to seize, and it means their sins stick to you. I'm gonna say that again. If you don't tell people they're forgiven and they don't know that they're forgiven, then they sit in their sins and really you're on the hook for it because their sins stick to you because you have not presented the good news well. That's scary stuff. It's really not when you know the good news. The good news is wonderfully exciting to proclaim. It's wonderful news. The gospel is amazing. Jesus made this point several times. So if you wanna know if Jesus is serious about this, four different times he says this. So if we pick up in Matthew five, he's giving the Beatitudes, the kingdom of God. I've said this before, I'll say it again. The kingdom of God was not something new. Jesus was announcing what the kingdom has always been. The meek have always inherited the earth. Blessed are the poor in spirit, and blessed are the peacemakers. It didn't just happen 2,000 years ago. That is the kingdom of God. And so he's announcing to them what the kingdom is. And so then he gives us the Lord's Prayer. Listen to what he says right after the Lord's Prayer. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Is he serious? See, again, this is what I keep saying. This is, this is what's hard for me personally is we'll read something in Revelation about 10 horns and dragons and bowls, and we'll be like, that's literal. And then when Jesus says, if you don't forgive, you're not forgiven, we're like, he didn't mean it. <laughs> Can we get back to the bowls and all that? <laughs> he meant it. He meant it. Because Christ is a restorer. And he's saying, if you do not proclaim forgiveness over somebody, you are on the hook for it because you are stopping the kingdom of God from advancing because the kingdom of God is about restoring people in the forgiveness of God. Why is Jesus serious about this? Because it's not just for other people, it's for you too. What's the saying? When you don't forgive your enemy, it's like you drinking poison and wanting your enemy to die. This is so important for you. For me, I've wrestled through this. Some of you are bitter. Some of you are angry. Some of you aren't feeling the love of God. Some of you aren't feeling the peace of God because you haven't took step number one seriously. You have been forgiven. Now announce that forgiveness over other people. Some of you are bringing stuff up with your spouse from 1996. <laughs> that's 30 years ago. I know that's weird to think about. Some of you are hindering your family's progression because you cannot forgive. That is hell. You are living in hell, right in here. Bitterness, weeping, gnashing of teeth, grinding, anger. And Jesus says it's not just for them. If you want the restoration of the world, you forgive yourself. You wanna hear a crazy reality? If everybody on the planet right now just stopped and said, please forgive me and I forgive you, Christ would come back. When everyone humbled themselves and says, I forgive you, do you forgive me? The entire world would change right now because the cross and the gospel is about not just receiving forgiveness but giving forgiveness out, which is why Jesus said to the apostles, freely you have been given, now freely give. And we see Peter had a little issue with that years into his life. Jesus is serious that the real gospel is we announce forgiveness over people and then it's up to them to receive it or not. I've, I've shared this passage three weeks now. I'm gonna share it again. I believe Paul, the apostle Paul's explanation here is the perfect presentation of the gospel. He says, therefore, from now on, we recognize no one by the flesh. So everything we see society doing, all the evil fleshly things, he says, yeah, that's what they're doing, but that's not who they are. 
even though we have known Christ by the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, remember, therefore is an important word. It's a finished thing. If anyone is in Christ, this person is a new creation. The old things have passed away, divorced. They've been divorced. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from who? From God, who reconciled us to himself when we said the prayer, when we did this, when we did that. No! Reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, so the good news, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Not just Christians, not just Western Christians, the world to himself. Not counting their wrongdoings against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. God is reconciled to you because perfect union in the incarnation. Now you repent and be reconciled to God. It's all done. It's, it's just, it's you now seeing it. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. So let me put this together with the gospel. What's Jesus saying? Peace be with you. You have perfect peace and union before God. Believe the good news. Look at these scars. Look at this side. It's finished. It's over. Why do you keep trying to add things to the gospel? Why do you keep putting things in the way of God's love? It's finished. It's over. Believe the good news. I breathe on you now so you have power with the Holy Spirit in perfect union knowing that no matter what happens in this world, you're gonna make it into the kingdom because you're sealed until the day of redemption and now as the Father sent me, I'm sending you to proclaim the good news that people are forgiven. Let them know the good news. It's done, it's over, they're forgiven. Amen? Amen? Here's how I think Jesus was saying this. Everything has been accomplished. Death in Hades has been defeated. Full forgiveness has been granted, shown by my scars, and perfect peace and union has been established. Therefore, go tell everyone in the world this glorious good news, the gospel, that the real king, real kingdom is here, and everyone is to be a part of it. But if you don't tell people they are forgiven, don't tell them it's all accomplished. If you put more burdens on them like the Pharisees did, then you yourself carry the weight of their judgment and there will be a reckoning with you. This is very serious, but one of my issues with the gospel in the Western church is we've made it just serious about people who haven't received it. It's very serious how we deliver it. Amen? Very serious how we deliver it. If we change or we add to this gospel or we make steps or we exclude people from the forgiveness of God, we are disobeying the king and we are missing the actual influence that we have. We miss it. Christ has made us influencers. I was doing this whole little subject. I didn't know what a social media influencer was, so I just kind of looked into it. It's crazy. Social media has allowed people to be experts when they're not experts. It's fantastic. And do you know that a lot of these influencers are just paid by other groups to influence their stuff? I just read an article about Coachella, that music concert, whatever it is, rave. <laughs> There's people who go to Coachella and they're paid influencers and they make $3,500 a post. You wouldn't get me off my phone if I was making $3,500 a post. But what are they influencing? Gucci bags, all kinds of stuff, fleshly stuff. We are influencers for the spiritual, real kingdom of the world. We carry an authority of the gospel of the real king that has not just been chiseled outside of cities. Christ says it is chiseled on our hearts. The good news is what we are influenced of. Augustus, when he announced his good news, it was good news to some, but not all. And I can tell you the difference is Augustus made his people follow him. Jesus does not. He respects free will. But we announce the gospel of forgiveness. That's the gospel we announce, and then we leave it up to God. So go back to Rome for a minute, okay? 
What the emperor or king or governor would do when he got into office, he would send a delegate called a curix. And that curix would give the kerygma. The kerygma was a public order. So these delegates would go in and they would announce the kerygma. It was a public order meant to unify. However, it demanded a response. You had to respond to this good news, even if it didn't seem like good news to you. The Apostle Paul used that same word as he was talking about his ministry. Now again, this is a military term. It's military language. He was announcing that the king has defeated evil and that his rule and reign is over all. It was military language. Paul was using that same word, but let me be very clear. I've said it the last couple weeks, I'm gonna drive it home. The early church was not persecuted because they went out and told Rome what they should be doing with their morals. They weren't persecuted for that. The early church was persecuted, so let me be clear. The Romans didn't care if the Christians were anti-abortion. They didn't care. The Romans didn't care what they thought about sexuality. The Romans didn't care about anything they were doing. What they cared about is the Christians wouldn't worship Caesar as God. And they were announcing a good news. An evangelion. The good news is here. The king is on his throne. This demands a response. That's why they were persecuted. So let me ask you, where is our focus going to be? And is it working? I don't mind private conversations with people. I don't mind talking about things in society. I do it all the time. But let me ask you, the church's way of holding signs and condemning people, how's that going in America? The church posting stuff on Instagram or social media all the time, going against all the sins of society. Is that helping anything? At Zootown Church, how about you and I proclaim the forgiveness and the good news of God and let God deal with it? Amen? That's who we are at Zootown Church. It doesn't mean I'm not convicted on things. It doesn't mean I don't believe in sin. It doesn't believe that. I don't think society's going to hell in a handbasket. But what I believe is as I see the, old, the, the early church, it was going to hell in a handbasket, and they went out and says, guess what? There's a new king in town. The new kingdom is here, and he pronounces your forgiveness. That is how people will come to know Jesus Christ. And it's so serious. This is how Jesus has commanded us to present the gospel. We all have been made curixes of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we announce the kingdom of God is here. Not in the future, it's here now. And the king has come to rule and reign, and he's a good king, and his rules are not burdensome. And the beauty of it is, he's already accepted you into his kingdom. Now believe the good news. Is our gospel still controversial? Yes, it is. Because what I'm saying to you is you are not the king. You are not God, and you do not run your own kingdom. And in a world that keeps saying, live your own truth, there's no such thing as your own truth. There is a king, and his name is Jesus. But he's not just a king. He's a physician. He's a shepherd. He's a good king but it demands a response. So the reason this message isn't good news to some is because you don't get to go around doing everything you wanna do. Now you can do it, but then you have chosen to leave the kingdom. But the king still says you're in. You choose to be in. It demands a response. The response is not on us. The response is to proclaim the kingdom of God and to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and to proclaim the good news of God's forgiveness. And then you know what you do when they say no? You trash them on social media. <laughs> you know what you do? You love them. You know that scene in Matthew 18 that's so taken out of context when Jesus says, yeah, if they don't accept it, treat them like an unbeliever and a tax collector. And we're like, yeah, we're gonna treat them like, treat them like crap. And you know what Jesus meant there? Like, oh no, I meant love them. How do we treat unbelievers? We love them. We don't say, well, they didn't accept it. Sucks to be them. We keep proclaiming God's love and forgiveness. And we do what Paul says. We beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. And then we say, 
It's up to you. But the fact is, is there's a new king, and he's the existing king, the alpha, the omega, and we live under his lordship, whether you believe it or not. And so believe the good news, my friends. Ben, come on up. We are not called to judge people. We are not called to condemn people. We are called to proclaim the Messiah's kingdom and his goodness. That is what we're called to do. The reason the Gnostics were heretics is because they believed they have a secret knowledge. They believed they were predestined. They were chosen by God with this secret knowledge. Well, the Kergama was not meant to be secret knowledge. It was meant to be proclaimed in public that everyone is a part of this kingdom. But again, it demands a response. The Kirgama demands a response. I love what Father Damick says, an Eastern Orthodox priest. He says, the gospel was a kerygma, a proclamation, a summons to respond to, and therefore not esoteric knowledge whispered by priests to their most devoted followers, cryptically encoded into obscure and difficult texts and hidden ritual. See what he's saying? We've made the good news too hard. The gospel proclaimed the coming of the king of kings, whose rule was extending throughout the whole cosmos. And so it was proclaimed openly, and everyone was expected to respond. Everyone was offered citizenship in this coming kingdom. So my dear friends, let me present the gospel to you. And if you deny this, we are still friends, because it's not on me. Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the Prince of peace that all time has changed. He is the Savior of all mankind. He conquered his enemies, sin and death, and he defeated Satan and Hades. It's done, it's finished, it's over. Now you stand completely forgiven, completely free, completely loved because of the scars in his hands and his size. He is your King. Now believe the good news. And that is my gospel presentation. Today we take communion, every week we take communion. As you said, I have found a new love for the Eucharist. The Eucharist matters. It really doesn't matter what I just said for a half hour. What matters is that you experience Christ. And what you're doing when you do this is you're saying, I believe, I am one with Christ, I have union with Christ. But the reason we do it is so we can go and proclaim it. And so you have been crawled to proclaim the good news, but the pressure is not on you. The pressure is on God. And so you just proclaim his goodness, you proclaim his forgiveness, but today you receive it for yourself. And just like Jesus said, freely you have given or received, freely you give. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Heaven and earth is filled with his glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Receive this and give this and let God do a mighty work in your heart of forgiveness that you may go proclaim his forgiveness to other people. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Believe the good news.